Hello again, my friends. The question is, is the osculating orbit of a planet meaningful? Let's, and specifically, is the osculating orbit of the moon meaningful in terms of understanding the path of the planet? So let me say that again. Is the osculating orbit of a planet, specifically the moon. So is the osculating orbit of the moon a good representation of the path of the moon? This is the question. Let's look at what the osculating orbit is. And you're going to see two different points of view. And I'm going to try to convince you <laughs> <laughs> that both point of, points of view actually make sense. Like you can put your mind in a certain frame frame of reference, and then this makes sense. No, no, that, that path, that's not the path of the moon. Then I'll try to change your frame of mind and go, oh yeah, yeah, that is the path of the moon. It just depends on how you think of it, okay? Let's, let's look at what an osculating orbit is. So here we have this video by a fellow named Volker Dorr, the three called the three body Lagrange problem with osculating orbits. Well, osculating orbits. He's going to show you osculating orbits. This is going to show what an osculating orbit is. And what he's showing here, before I start playing this, is he's got the orbits of three planets. Now this is a little bit different from the situation of the moon going around the earth or the earth going around the sun or whatever because he's got three orbits um, that are quite different from how it looks in our solar system, but that's okay. It demonstrates the concept beautifully. So these are three planets. This Up at the top is a yellow planet. In the lower right is a reddish color planet. And in the lower left is this bluish color planet. And we are going to watch these planets move. Okay, you ready for this? I'm gonna click on this play button, and it's going to start moving. And what you're going to notice, I'll give you a heads up, is that this orbit of this yellow planet, it's not going to stay like this. It's going to get very, very wide and very large, and it's going to, get, it's going to change dramatically. And according to the theory of osculating orbits, that orbit of the planet is not this nice egg shape, you know, this ellipse. The orbit is actually not constant. It's almost like a living thing. So we're used to thinking of the orbit of a planet as, oh, it goes round and round, you know, in this egg shaped thing, very boring. But according to this theory of osculating orbits, that's kind of an illusion not a real, well, I shouldn't say illusion, it's kind of a summation or conclusion. But what's actually happening is that the orbit is not a nice little, nice uh, perfect ellipse. It's actually like almost like a living thing that's changing. Okay, so that might be a little hard to get comfortable with because we're used to thinking of the orbit of a planet as you know, pretty much going over the same area of the sky. It's just going, because that's what happens in the, in the long term. But according to the theory of osculating orbits, even though in, in the broad view, the planet is going in, through almost the same path each time, at a micro level, it's like if you took a, a magnifying glass and you zoom in, it's actually doing a lot of disturbing stuff. It's similar how to we could say something physical like this glass looks stable, right? It's not jumping around. There it is. But the molecules, you know, if you zoomed in, they're like, they're going crazy all over the place. That's, that's an analogy. What we're saying is that the path of the planet looks, it appears just like any physical thing, looks stable. But when you look closely, there's actually a lot of wild stuff going on. In this case, it's not chaotic. It's, it looks almost like a living thing, like it, it expands, like a breathing, like it expands out, that it contracts. 
So again, yes, the path of the planet is very regular when we look at it over time, but if we zoomed into very short periods of time, we would see that that orbit is actually like breathing, okay? So this is what the path of these planets actually look like from a mathematical analysis of changing the osculating elements moment by moment. Okay, I'm going to play it. Go. All right, you see this yellow guy? Okay, the orbit's not changing. You see it's growing. They're growing. <laughs> it looks like a living thing. Oh, no, it's spreading. Look how much it's spread. Now it closes back in. The yellow, this, the orbit looks like almost like a living thing that's shrinking. And while we're watching all of these changes, what we're also seeing is that in the long run, the path of the planet is very stable. It is, it comes back around to this stable orbit where it almost repeats its position each time. But in the short term, when you zoom in, see the orbit, it's growing, <laughs> it's getting big. And yet, while that's happening, the, the final result of the planet appears to not be changing so radically. So you have this almost like contradictory thing where the final result of the planet's motion is, it, one is that, whoops, let me stop this. It went to a commercial um, uh, thing there. Let me get back to my PowerPoint. I need to see that weird commercial. <laughs> So getting back to what I was saying about the orbit is that the planet does follow this kind of very regular thing coming back. But when you zoom into it, like day by day, the orbit is actually like breathing, getting bigger and smaller and, and turning around and pretty dramatically for the moon, like the moon much more than any other planet, because the moon experiences more perturbations. So for the planets, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, yeah, the orbit's changing, but not as wildly as like we just saw. I mean, just like a little bit. So intuitively, that may not bother us so much. But with the moon, the moon's osculating elements do move pretty dramatically. So consequently, the apogee, the point that's farthest away in the moon's orbit, the osculating apogee is moving 30 degrees to the left and to the right. It's going all over the place. The osculating apogee of the moon is the true black moon Lilith. True black moon Lilith can be described in two ways, but one of the ways it can be described is as the apogee of the moon. Where is the moon farthest away from the Earth? There's a point. And the osculating apogee of the moon, just like we just saw in that demonstration, it, it's changing all the time. It swerves all over the place, like 30 degrees to each side, moving fairly fast. But the overall orbit of the moon is really not changing. I hope now you can see the two different points of view. Point of view number one, the osculating apogee is not the apogee of the moon. It just isn't because the, the, the actual overall motion of the moon do, does not have an orbit that's swerving all over the place. So from that point of view, the people that think the osculating apogee of the moon is meaningful, they think we're nuts. Like, you guys are crazy. Because I'm one of those people. It's just, we are nuts. The orbit of the moon does not swerve all over the place. The osculating elements are just like fudge things. They're just something that happens to work. You know I mean? It's, they're just not... They're just used by astronomers to calculate things. But it's not... The orbit, the overall orbit of the moon is not dancing all over the sky. That's one point of view. 
The other point of view, which is the one that I makes more sense to me, is that this orbit of the moon that we humans see and that looks so stable is only because we human beings are not able to experience directly the, I would call it the sacred geometry, the sacred geometry behind life. We're only seeing this final result. Our senses are too dull to experience what's happening. We're too gross. You know, it's like a, it's like a big, it's not granular enough, not detailed enough. But it, it's just like, again, look at the glass, looks nice and stable. But underneath all that stability, there's all this stuff going on. Now, is all that stuff going on beneath what we see meaningful? Does it relate to our worlds? And some people would say, no, it doesn't, because that's not what we see. That's not what's going on observationally in any, you know, in any clear way. But from the point of view that if astrology is not just observational, if it's about underlying sacred geometry, the underlying instantaneous reality, and if, as we believe in vibrational astrology, it's actually working from a higher dimensional space, or you could call it spiritual level, then this underlying reality is meaningful. In fact, more likely to be meaningful. So the fact that the... Here, here's another argument for why I think true Black Moon Lilith makes more sense, is that those osculating elements that have the planet swerving all over the place, they tell us exactly where the planet's going to be. I mean, the extreme precision. It would be a strange coincidence if those osculating elements that work so beautifully, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, they, they work. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> they predict exactly where the planet's going to be, and they do it in a very elegant way, that makes it easy to, relatively easy, to figure out where the planet will be in the future. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it would be a strange coincidence that this whole theory of osculating elements just happens to work. Like, oh, you know, just, like they just fudged it and just works very nicely. It's more likely that behind the visible world, there's some simple function going on such as only six things that are varying and create this living, breathing kind of osculating orbit, that is what's more real and fundamental and that astrology is, is connected to this deeper, finer level. We especially believe this in vibrational astrology because what we interpret is not visible either. Like we're taking three hundredths of a circle, five hundredths of a circle, like this very detailed, intricate thing that's not ob like obviously visible. I can't look at the sky and say, oh, this planet is in some hundredths of a circle from this one and all these intricate, beautiful patterns. We cannot see those with our human eye, but they are there. There's most things are not visible to humans. You know, our eyes and our ears are just particular senses to, to certain vibrational frequencies and they interpret them in certain ways. So the point of view of vibrational astrology is that there is this beautiful, sacred, intricate, you know, it's a very sophisticated, elegant uh, geometry that just, it's like a, we're looking at like a, a changing mandala, like a kaleidoscope of things that are moving and changing at levels that our eyes and ears do not see, and that's managing what goes on in our lives, just like your biochemistry you don't see. I mean, if you have a vitamin deficiency, you don't look at your body and go, oh, gee, I'm, I'm low in vitamin D. You know, there's all kinds of intricate things going on that are determining our lives. So from our point of view, 
where we think there's a higher dimensional space from which astrology works and there's a beautiful sacred geometry that underlies life, then the black, the osculating black moon Lilith makes perfect sense. From the other point of view, this, and this sounds pretty convincing actually, is when we say that the osculating black moon Lilith is at a certain place, in the sky, the moon actually never gets to that point. It never actually reaches that point. In the demonstration I showed at the beginning of this video, we saw the path of those planets extend extremely far out. That is the instantaneous path of the planet. The osculating orbit is the instantaneous orbit. It's the orbit at that moment. And moment by moment, it's changing. So that instantaneous orbit is one that the planet never reaches. I mean, obviously, if you rewatch this video and you watch that demonstration at the beginning of this video, when that planet, like the yellow one at the top, is reaching way out, well, the, that planet's never going to head towards that. That's just the orbit at that instant, and it will keep changing. Okay, you got it? Two different points of view basically boils down to this. Is the orbit as we see it, we human beings see, we see the moon go around the earth in pretty much very close, not exactly, but very close. That's the orbit from, from, from the point of view of many astrologers. That's the orbit. That's what we're talking about. That's the orbit. And the osculating elements don't show that. So they're wrong. <laughs> it's just some mathematical thing that astronomers dreamed up and also the way they dreamed it up it's it, it's not the most elegant solution in the world it takes a lot of calculation it just seems like it's not real the opposite point of view you're like flipping things instead of saying what your eye sees is somehow more fundamental you're saying that there's a constantly fluctuating sacred geometry just like there are fluctuating atoms and molecules, lots of things are happening. There's, that's actually more essential and real. So you can see how people completely disagree about whether the true black moon Lilith makes any sense. From my point of view, as a vibrational astrologer, and as a person who believes that there's a sacred geometry underlying life, it's like a no-brainer. True black moon Lilith makes sense. But from other points of view, it makes no sense at all. Okay, so I hope this helps you understand this controversy and, and why people just completely disagree and just sometimes just don't understand how you can even think these things. And I think both points of view are reasonable, and I happen to think the true black moon Lilith makes way more sense and is exactly what I would expect would be the the correct um, Black Moon Lilith. So, Alice Triangle and Dieter Koch, uh, who have great expertise in celestial mechanics, do not think the oscillating orbit has any significance in other in in astrology. They say that the true Black Moon Lilith is false. <laughs> I put a little smiley face there because that word "true" is very deceiving. It's called true, but it's false. Uh, and, and just to share with you a little bit more about this controversy, I'll, I'll, I have a quote from this Swiss ephemeris. A quote, the lunar, the lunar orbit is far from being an ellipse. The amplitude of the oscillation of the osculating apogee around the mean apogee is plus or minus 30 degrees. That's what I was just talking about, right? The, the osculating apogee of the moon, it's swerving all over the place, 30 degrees either side while the actual apogee's deviation from the mean one never exceeds five degrees. By actual, he means when the moon comes back around, it's not swerving all over the place. We just saw that in the video I showed at the beginning, how the osculating orbit changes into, in ways that the planet will actually never travel on there because it'll, it'll change back and, and follow path. So what he says is true. 
That is tr true, I agree 100%. It's just how you want to think of it. <laughs> it's just that the final result of the orbit is not the real thing. And that sounds a little strange to me. It would be a little hard to, to, to think of it because the orbit is the orbit is the orbit. So I think you got these two different points of view of how we can take the same astronomical facts and interpret what's likely to be meaningful to astrology in completely different ways. He continues in section 2.2.4 with this statement, as has been said above, the osculating lunar apogee, so-called true Lilith, is a mathematical con construct which assumes the motion of the moon is a two-body problem. This solution is obviously too simplistic. These oscillations have to be considered an artifact of the insufficient model. They do not really show a motion of the apsides. Apside is another term for apogee. Apsides means either apogee or aphelion. So it's a nice word to, to instead of having to say apogee or aphelion, we have a word for it, apsides. So anyway, there's the difference of opinion. It's an artifact of an insufficient model. He's saying scientists are not able, you know, astronomers are not able to model the motion of the planets in a way <clears throat> that makes any sense. They just have this mathematical construct that just just used because we don't have a way to do what we call an analytic solution, a direct formula. There is no direct formula for determining the oscillating elements. That inclines people to be skeptical of it, like they're just fudged. It's a construct that happens to work. Are the oscillating elements constructs that happen to work? Or do they reveal some inner process? And there's no way to know. But this much, I think, is clear. Both points of view are reasonable. So when people would, you might say, this other point of view is crazy. No, I think both points of view are reasonable. Um, I suspect the true black moon Lilith makes much more sense. And the research that Michelle Love is doing I, is going to confirm that and with a level of confidence that goes way beyond just personal observations. The personal observations are also confirming what the data is telling us. Okay, so I, I think you've got it. Now, Juan Revilla, another astrologer, astronomer, and I conclude that the true black moon Lilith is most likely to be the one that astrologers should use. So for a while in this discussion, it was me against everybody else. I was saying, hey, the osculating orbit I think is real. And they're going, what do you mean it's real? It's going all over the place. The planet doesn't move. And then uh, towards the end of the conversation, Juan Revilla came in and, and uh, also agrees with me, so I'm not, I'm not alone. And, and I think some other people probably do as well. But based on the pure astronomy of it, there are different points of view. Um, so on the next slide, I'm going to show why the mean black moon Lilith is not reasonable. Well, let's just talk about the mean black moon Lilith, because some of you may be, you know, feeling that the mean black moon Lilith also makes sense. Everybody who understands the astronomy agrees. Alice Triangle, Dieter Koch, Juan Revilla, myself, and everybody else. There's lots of other people in this discussion who are very knowledgeable and have a lot of intuition about it. Almost everybody sees the mean black moon Lilith as not likely to be uh, important astrologically. Now, if research shows that it works, that means our, our theory is not very good. There's something else going on. Observation is what's most important. The problem with observation in astrology is that a lot of it is very subjective and, um, you know, how much confidence does it give you. But anyway, we all agree that the mean black moon Lilith is not reasonable. I want to talk about that. I want to also explain what the natural black moon Lilith is. That was the one introduced into the Swiss ephemeris because... Um, the people who developed the Swiss firmers felt that both the true black moon Lilith and the mean black moon Lilith make no sense. So they introduced a third one that they thought made more sense, which is the natural black moon Lilith. And then I'll talk a little bit more specifically about additional reasons for thinking true black moon Lilith is the actual moon, black moon Lilith. So I'll do that in the third video in the series. 
go over these additional details, why the mean black moon lilith makes no sense at all. What is this thing called natural black moon lilith? Why? I don't think it works, but some other people do. And uh, some other points of view that support why true black moon lilith is the actual black moon lilith. A little more uh, new perspectives, additional perspectives on why that makes sense. I've already given you a good explanation, but there's some additional ways to think of it. Okay, I'll do that in the third part of this series on videos on which Black Moon Lilith is the correct one. My answer, true. Black Moon Lilith, it is the correct one. According to other people, it's the natural Black Moon Lilith. Okay, I'll see you in part three and we'll go over these additional points. Again, thank you very much for watching. God bless. Namaste.